Hey, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for doing this. I, I appreciate it. I know um, it's uh, it was kind of out of the blue. You know, I was talking to Marty Klukas, and uh, he he mentioned that um, you, he was stationed. You guys were stationed together, and um, um, I just he, I asked him if I could reach out to you, and he uh, made contact. So I, I really appreciate you doing this. I I, um, I think it's interesting what he was kind of the way your dynamic you guys had back in the early days of Ranger Tech P essentially. And uh, I, because I was, I was stationed at Fort Benning for about 11 years and supported Third Ranger Battalion in the regiment. So it's nice to hear, kind of like guys that came before me and how it all kind of, kind of started. I mean, really, and uh, and where we've come from there. So yeah, um, if you don't mind, uh, and I know you were, you had a previous uh, career in the Marine Corps. So if you, if you wouldn't mind, can we talk about uh, what got you into the military? And then um, talk about your Marine Corps days, and then we'll kind of just go go on from there. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here, so thank you very much. Oh yes, um, sir. I had well, I was drafted in 1966, and uh, actually, I volunteered for the draft because I was going to be drafted anyway. Sure. So that's a long time ago, and <laughs> I ended up uh, uh, in the army, and I was with uh, sent to Vietnam. And uh, I was with the 1st Infantry Division, and I uh, was a grunt. And while there, I volunteered for uh, to be a LERP. And I ended up going to uh, the 1st Division uh, LERPs, which at the time, I think, was F Company. Uh, it hadn't become the 75th Rangers yet. It was just F Company, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Later on in January of 68, I think they transitioned to uh, the actual Ranger Regiment, and we became I Company uh, 75th Ranger Regiment. Okay. And that's how I started out with, uh, I think, the Rangers for the first time around. Huh. Um, spent my time there, came back in 1968, and uh, uh, went back to college. Of course, I had flunked out the first time around. <laughs> because <laughs> I wasn't there for the proper reason. But I ended up uh, graduating, taught school for one year, and then always wanted to be an aviator. So I actually uh, joined the Marine Corps and with an aviation contract and ended up becoming a uh, bombardier navigator or a BN, an EA-6 intruder. And wow. that commenced in 1974, something like that. So that's how I got to be a Marine. Uh, enjoyed every minute uh, that I was there and uh, ended up, due to family reasons, ended up transitioning to the Air Force and flew F-111s with those guys till 1986, I think it was, and then volunteered to be the ALO with the uh, Ranger Battalion and was uh, stationed at uh, Savannah, Georgia with First Bat and... That's where I met Marty. And I retired out of there. I retired in 1992 and uh, ended up going to Panama with those guys and going to Iraq with those guys both. Oh, that's right. That's right. You and Marty were fortunate enough to um, be the like one of the only select few P Rangers that went to uh, Desert Storm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. were uh, we were attached to Bravo Company. Marty was uh, Bravo Company's uh, attack. And I ended up going over as the representative, I guess you would call it, the ALO representative for the uh, battalion. Okay. So, um, if do you mind uh, going back to Vietnam, or do you, or do, is that something you like to talk about, or are you comfortable talking well, about I, what you did over there? Or I don't have a problem with that at all. No. Okay. Yeah, I just find it interesting because we don't, I don't get to talk to a lot of Vietnam vets, and especially guys that worked with LERP. So. Is there anything that, um, like, how was that, how was that experience? Like, what was it like to, to do that? And were you guys, was it uh, stringent or did you guys have a little leeway or how, how was your, how were your operations conducted over there when you were with alert? Uh, that was, uh, that was a very interesting, uh, challenging, unique assignment. There weren't many folks that were uh, on there and it was, a, it was an all volunteer force. And I was stationed at like, Hey, at the time. And one of the most, uh, I think one of the most challenging things that I had while I was there was I went to Recondo school 
And that was, I forget if it was two weeks or three weeks, but it was in country at uh, Natrang. And uh, I believe it was fifth special forces who ended up running that school. And uh, that was all practical application with the final, final, I guess, test being you actually went out on a patrol and did a uh, mission with the uh, the instructor and i guess graduation depended upon if you came back or not but that was probably the most challenging uh school uh i had ever been to and uh i am grateful that i went got through it i'm grateful that i met the folks i did and got my recondo number 0902 yeah. which is <laughs> I got it memorized. <laughs> was it uh, when you say challenging? Was it uh, physically or mentally or both? Or how? Like how was it? Uh, like tell tell me a little about a bit about it. Well, some of the first things that uh, one of the the highlights I remember because that's a long time ago, but it's embedded up here. Was first of all, I had never been done any medical stuff, and they uh, they had us take blood from each other. Okay. I'm not sure why, but uh, I know I was partnered up with a guy and Jesus, he missed my veins. I don't know how many times that holes holes all over my arm. <laughs> In fact, we had to switch arms. Uh, <laughs> he kept going through, but that was challenging. And then when I got to do it, it was like, okay, this is something I never expected to do in life. Okay. And I got to do it. It was an interesting challenge to hit that vein and not go through it. We, you know, and for, for that, that was something, an experience that, you know, although small, it's an experience that I never thought I'd have in life. Right. One of the other things I remember was there was, a, there was a, I forget exactly what it was called, but it was a big bear pit and it was a big circular pit that they had uh, dug. And it probably was oh, maybe seven, eight feet high. And what they would do is they would stick two teams down in there and the goal was to throw the other team out. Okay. And, <laughs> it, you know, sometimes it, it, we had a Korean team with us. And I remember there was a first Cav uh, team that was there. And they had a linebacker that had played, I think, at Central Michigan. Big, burly guy. But he got sent in with the Korean team. And uh, actually... The doggone guys from the first cab were getting beat up so bad they were trying to get out of the pit, and the Korean guys were pulling them back in so they could thump <laughs> the hell out of them. And the Korean captain was there with a big old pole beating on his people so they would let them get out at certain times. It was an interesting experience. Yeah. The last thing I can remember is we had uh, one of the physical challenges was we had to uh, run. I. I don't remember exactly the distance, but something like seven or nine miles sticks in my brain. But it was with a, a sandbag in your pack. Okay. And uh, you had to run that in a certain amount of time. And they had the track was basically the perimeter, some of it going outside of the perimeter itself. And they would they accompanied us with uh, Jeeps and uh, weapons on the Jeeps. And at times, there was sniper fire. So that was a challenge. But again, the Korean team excelled. They ended up with one, first, second, third, fourth, uh, sixth, and seventh place. They missed fifth place. The Filipino got that. But those two guys that didn't make it in the first six, they came back. They had welts on them. The captain took care of them for a while also after it was over. But those those were challenging, challenging uh, physical th things that, you know, having volunteered for that, people enjoyed those challenges. Sure. But then going out on the actual mission for the first time, uh, going through that, it was a... Uh, it was interesting. Again, you know, <laughs> I had been in country a little while, but hadn't been in country all that long, about four months, and had never been experienced doing that. So it caught it got your attention. Sure. I just find it interesting, you know, having been – because the way we deployed uh, was a little different than – 
even it was different than Vietnam for sure. And even different than, um, than just cause, you know, we were more in the desert environment and the mountains and stuff. And it was a different kind of an enemy that we were fighting. So, um, I always find it fascinating to hear guys like you who were in Vietnam or were in just cause talk about the differences of the terrain and the, the enemy and the, you know, just the, the nature of the combat. Yeah. Again, you know, it's been a long, long time since I was there 50 sure. years plus, but some of the things that stick in my mind, the memories that are imp imp implanted in there was the uh, jungles. And by that, they were thick. They got to be real thick at times. And I can remember one time going through the jungle and uh, they had these big red ants over there. And these things were like carnivorous. And they had big, uh, like, leaves that they would weave into a nest. And uh, I was... I think I was on point or something that particular day. We were actually having to crawl to get through some of the areas. And I ran into one of the uh, ant nests. Oh. And uh, man, I tell you what, I never stripped so fast in my life. <laughs> there were other people that were over there helping like beat the beat these damn things, uh, get them off my body. And they just attacked. They were, uh, they were aggressive. <laughs> and as you can see, I don't, I, I remember a lot of the good stuff is, or the funny stuff that happened. Sure, right? sure. That's more, a lot yeah. of guys are like that, for sure. So it was, yeah. uh, it was, an, and that was interesting. There are several other stories that, uh, <laughs> that I could tell you that, I, that, you know, these were the funny things that I did. I remember Please, one time. Yeah, for sure. They, we were in a base camp, and this is when I was with a line unit. And we were in a base camp, and uh, every time you moved into a different place, you had they rotated digging the fifty hole, because a fifty caliber hole was a big asshole, yeah. and you had to. It took forever. So I remember myself and these two other guys, we were digging this thing, and in in the in the uh, dry season, the the freaking ground got just like cement. And all we had was e-tools and stuff like that. So we're trying to dig this hole. And it's like digging cement. Yeah. So we get this bright idea. We're going to get some C4 and we're going to blast the hole and loosen everything <laughs> up. So we get, we dig a hole at probably maybe a, a foot deep and maybe, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 inches wide. We stuff as much C4 in there as we can. And this is this where the battalion had moved into these uh, this area, and we yelled fire in the hole, and we got behind something I don't know what it was, but we pushed the plunger, and man, we had way too much C four in there. <laughs> and I, I'll never remember the first sergeant came running down. I'll always remember. I should say, first sergeant came running down. We actually blew the battalion CP tent down and had some <laughs> holes put in it from the, from the rocks. And well, we still. And the funny part was, we got done. We walked over. We looked at it, and we had about a crater uh, that was about ten feet wide and about six inches deep. So we had to continue <laughs> to dig that damn thing all day long. And we got in trouble for that one. That was a good one too. And oh, yeah. <laughs> the first time for me, this was something it, it, you never know what you don't know. Yeah. And the first time I got shot, got shot at over there, <laughs> we were, I was out on a, uh, with a guy and we were out on an ambush and uh, well, there were more of us, obviously, but we were out on ambush and uh, we got found. So uh, I had, uh, this is, this is, this is a good one, but they, they issued us, uh, when we went out on these, they issued us uh, Benny's, Benzedrine, to keep okay. awake at night, because there were only 60 out there, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I remember we took, I took a Benzedrine, I, I had never taken any drugs before in my life, I came from a small town in Wisconsin, and uh, they said, if you get sleepy, take one of these, and you'll stay awake. So I thought, okay, that's fine. And uh, so I, I, they asked me how many you want. I had never had any drugs before. So I said, well, give me about a half dozen. And he <laughs> said, so I took one and I, I was still sleepy. So I took another one. I think I ended up taking like three bennies. And uh, finally the guy, uh, 
I was time to switch. Uh, uh, there were two man positions, yeah. time time to switch, and I woke the guy up next to me, and he's like, he was an old guy, old guy had been there a long time, and I said, it's, it's your, I'm not tired because by now I was the Bennies had kicked in, and I was right. listening to Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, band, and I was seeing Dumbo flying through the skies and shit <laughs> like that, and uh, he, I said, I'm not tired, but you know, here you go, and I laid down. And he took a watch, and I, I swear, I don't know exactly where, how long time was not a factor at that point, but uh, he, he woke me up, and he said, we got, when they didn't wake me up, I was awake. He just re reached over there and said, we got movement. I thought, okay. And about then, the claymore, claymores all went off, and I went from the horizontal to the vertical. I stood straight up in the middle of all that shit going on, and he grabbed me and Pulled, this was my first time under fire. He pulled me down and he said, if you ever do that again and give away our position, I'll shoot you. So, uh, <laughs> so that was my reaction the first time under fire. I never did it again, by the way, but nice. uh, that was my first reaction under fire. So those were some of the fun, funny stories I got. You know, I remember the, the good stuff. I yeah, talk yeah. about the good stuff. I, For sure. That, that's what I do to try to get through it. Yeah, so yeah, those, yeah. those are some of the things in Vietnam. But uh, I know after I went through Recondo School, I got back and they, they taught us tracking. They taught us how to walk through the woods and how to be quiet, et cetera. So we went out on a, uh, a mission and I was on point because they wanted to see what the new guy would do. And I was doing things exactly the way we had been taught how mm -hmm. to do it, move slowly through the... Uh, through the jungle and uh, evidently uh, I wasn't moving fast enough, but the guy, the patrol or the uh, leader of the uh, unit at that time said, you need to pick it up, which made me feel uncomfortable because yeah. this isn't how I was taught to do it, but he had been there longer than I was. So I thought, okay, I'll pick it up. So we got out, we set up and uh, this was very interesting we set up in single man positions and uh, I don't know why, but somehow we got compromised. And uh, one of the ways they used to communicate was they would tap sticks together okay. to let them know where they were. But I could, I could hear this tapping off to my left and I'm figuring, okay, how long am I going to wait till I, you know, am I going to see them or what am I going to do or how is this all going to play out? So you're processing your movements at the time, how you're going to address what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, again, this wasn't claymores. It was a couple of grenades went off. We had a rally point And uh, uh, so it was like, OK, fine, I don't have to worry about this guy because we're all moving out to the rally point we we got back to the rally point and we were missing a guy oh, no. so uh, we had to go back and get him we found him he had a sucking chest wound we got him out got him back he went to the hospital got better and uh, it was just a small piece of shrapnel that had penetrated but uh, oh. got him out and uh, that uh, that time you did you, that time you're not sure you're scared what you're doing is you're just planning for what your next move is processing what's going on and what are the what are the moves you're going to make to address the situation that you're in at this point in time and slowing down everything and thinking thinking through it and reacting the way you've been trained if, if anything that i've learned throughout my military career, and now with my civilian career that I've been in for a while, it's you will, you will, no matter what, you will do exactly what you do in training. I don't give a hoot what it is, especially under high stress situations. So I've taken that with me and applied it for the rest of my life. Yeah, that's great advice. That lesson has been passed down through all of us. I mean, that's, that's what, uh, and I know, weren't you... Were you stationed with, was Keith Ingram there when you were stationed there? Yes, he yeah. was. He was my first supervisor when I first came in the military. 
So all that, all those lessons that you guys, that you taught him or that he learned from you or that you guys learned together, he passed that on to me. And, uh, it's really interesting that some of the things you're saying, I've, I remember hearing, uh, you know, from Keith. So it's a, kind of an interesting kind of a chain of events. Yeah, that uh, transition uh, from my career back to the Rangers, when I went back as ALO, was interesting because I carried all the old stuff that I had been taught in Vietnam back with sure. that, all the grunt, the infantry stuff that I had gone through. And when I got to the Ranger Battalion, for me, it was almost like going back home. I volunteered. I wanted to be there. I specifically asked to go to the Rangers when I went back as an ALO. And when I got back there, the uh, the uh, TACP at the time had uh, somebody else who was in charge and didn't train with the Rangers, trained in a separate way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came back as a senior individual, and my immediate response was, to, okay, when the Rangers want, run, we won't run. When the Rangers go out and train, we go out and train. We are part of the rangers we do exactly what they do we're not we are air force but we are rangers are air force personnel attached to the ranger battalion training doing whatever they do and uh that paid off later on uh roger cross was there also and john mckay right so that paid off because we all ended up going somewhere at some time to uh, actually get in the combat portion of it. Yep. So and that's, that, was, that has, that what you established ha has transitioned all the way through when I was in. I mean, we, we still continue, we had that same mentality and we say, had the same mindset and we felt that was the same, the only way to really support those guys. Because if you're, if you're doing your own thing and then you get into combat, you're, the training is different. So you're not, you're not training with them. You're not, you know, you're not learning their TTPs or their, you know, their, you know, their battle drills and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah they have doing that. They have to trust you as well as we have to trust them. For sure. And we were there. The TACP, I always thought about it this way. If they call on us and they need us and we need, we have to provide, we better be able to do it. And not only that, but we better be able to do it well. Sure. Right. So, well, not, I want to talk more about this, but I, I don't want to skip over your Marine Corps days because that's I think that's fascinating oh. that you went from this uh, ground guy, this LERP, to an aviator. So if you don't mind, can we talk a little more? Like, so and if you want to, we can go through, um, you know, your the the college days too. Was there anything interesting? Where'd you go? To, where did you go to school? Uh, well, I actually went to a small school in uh, Wisconsin. It was called Lakeland College, and uh, again, I, I used. I used football to get through it. Okay. So by that, I mean, I got some financial assistance to go through there. At that point in time, I was married and I had two small kids. Wow. So that was also an interesting challenge. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I got to the Marine Corps. And the, the thing about the Marine Corps, this whole process of my uh, career was really all geared to supporting the grunt. Because the Marine Corps aviators, I don't know if you, uh, if you have heard the terminology, but every Marine is, a, is an infantryman, is right. a grunt. And uh, so everything that you do is geared to do nothing more than support the guy on the ground. So, and at any time, if they need people on the ground, that's your primary MOS. I don't care if you're an aviator or a cook, what, but you are a grunt, no sure. matter what. Yep. And based on that, the A-6 was designed and all the aircraft that the Marine Corps had at that time and have today also, they are designed to support close air support. Right. And uh, so every time that you ended up going out or going on missions, your missions were all training for supporting the grunt. So that also, when I got back to the battalion, that mentality stayed there all, also. So, and it really, uh, it really contradicted some of the, uh, the uh, philosophies or theories that the Air Force had when I went back to the Air Force, because the Air Force conversely had only one plane actually dedicated to the grunt, and that was the A-10. Right. So when I was flying the F-11 with the Air Force, it was just a, a, a different mentality that I had to get used to. 
So the Marine Corps A6, uh, it was an amazing airplane. It uh, had the uh, the radar, the, the, the most, uh, the best radar at the time when it was designed and well into its career, it still had the best radar and it could support literally anybody, anywhere, anytime. It was an all weather aircraft, so it didn't matter where you were, uh, what was out there. You could go in and put bombs on target. Nice. It was, but it was slow as hell. <laughs> <laughs> it was a swept wing A-10 is what it was pretty much. But every guy in that, in that cockpit, every person to a person knew what their job was. And their job was to help the guy on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. But I've always liked that about the Marines, the, the, um, like you were saying, just the attention to the, the ground, the, the focus on the ground, regardless of whatever platform it is, they're there to support those Marines that are in the fight. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah. I did end up uh, ejecting out of one of those aircraft. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. There was a malfunction in the, one of the flight control systems and I ended up ejecting out of one of those and uh, never really got a parachute uh, because we were well out of the envelope and it was an old drew five uh, martin baker seat so i sort of just hit the ground and skidded along on the ground oh my uh, god for a while and got some pretty su substantial injuries but worked my way back and continued on with the aviation career so then you left the marines and then you said you you uh taught for a little bit before you left the air force probably, uh, that was yeah, prior to going into the uh, back into the service. I did one year of teaching in Colfax, Wisconsin. Okay. What did you teach? Uh, I taught history. Oh, all right. <laughs> which, which every dumb jock does teaches right, history right. or driver's ed, one of the two. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was the head football coach as well as uh, baseball. Oh, it was a very cool. small, small school, and you know. You didn't get paid much, so any extra money you could make was good. But decided that uh, I, I was fortunate because I knew I wanted to be in the military from very, very small on. And uh, I, after getting back from Vietnam, I knew I wanted to go back in. I, I knew it. I just, I had a family. I wasn't sure, you know, exactly how I would do that. But at one point in time, I came home and I told my then wife, uh, I'm joining the Marine Corps, and I'm going to be an aviator. That's something I always wanted to do. Not many people in their lifetime will have a dream from as little as they can remember that they can actually fulfill. So as a human being, I was very fortunate to live a dream, actually live the dream. When they say living the dream, yeah, well, I was. And then, uh, so what made you decide to leave the Marines? And then what made you decide to join the Air Force after that? Having been in like, uh, you know, kind of those ground focused um, MOSs, you kind of alluded to it that you weren't really sure about how the Air Force mentality was. But um, yeah, what made you make that transition to the Air Force? Well, this is going to be selfish. But at that point in time, the Marine Corps, literally every six months, uh, you'd have a year at home and then you'd deploy for six months. It was literally that, that because because they had started different rotations with the squadrons, etc. And I decided, uh, both my wife and I decided that uh, I needed more time with the kids. I needed more family time. So we had heard that the Air Force was uh, a lot more comfortable, to right. say, <laughs> so to speak. And right. so we decided I made that transition to the Air Force and went and uh, had to go for some reason i had to go through celestial navigation and then be assigned to an f-111 squadron i don't know why i had to go through celestial navigation you never use it but yeah. maybe it's a way of weeding people out they damn near got me but uh, <laughs> so, so i ended up being assigned to an f-111 squadron in uh training squadron in mountain home idaho and then uh, ended up going to uh Upper Hayford in England with the F-111 squadrons over there. Oh, cool. And then came back with the F-111 squadrons. Uh, and <clears throat> that's what I volunteered to go back to the Ranger Battalions uh, at that point in time. Yeah. 
Did it have was, anything to do with kind of like you were talking about as far as the mentality of – it's no hit on any aviators in the Air Force. I mean, that, they have their mission. They have their focus. But maybe that wasn't something that uh, that spoke to you. You know, you were kind of more of a ground-oriented kind of guy, and you're like, is that what kind of made that, you go back? That did – I missed – I missed the – I miss that portion of it. I miss the challenge. I miss the uh, uh, the camaraderie. There is no such. I mean, you you can't you can't explain it to anybody. You can't. There's no way you can verbally feel what's going on inside with that camaraderie with somebody that you go to combat with or you go to train with on a day to day basis. When you get to the lowest common denominator of uh, living or dying, or nothing else matters. There's a bond that never goes away that many people will never have in their lifetime. So I missed that terribly. Yeah. And uh, I, I yearned to go back to the grunt. And uh, although I enjoyed the aviation and all that stuff, my true heart was with the guy on the ground. And I wanted to be able to do anything and everything I could do to support that guy on the ground. But, so then you went to Savannah, 1st Battalion. Yes. Which, yep. That's a good area. That's, that's, I never heard anything bad about, I never, I was stationed in Benning, but it, it's okay. But I heard Savannah's a real nice area to, <laughs> to be stationed. Yes, Savannah is not overwhelmed with the military personnel. And Savannah is a beautiful, beautiful city. And they have the best military St. Patrick's Day you could ever imagine. Right, right. <laughs> I enjoyed Savannah tremendously. Did you guys ever do the, um, did they invite you to do the parade with them when they marched oh. down the, Every year, there's one of the, I believe, one of the companies every year would march in the parade. Yeah. I never did. I, I, I was on the sidelines, you know, yeah. <laughs> supporting them guys with beer. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, so um, tell me about the lead up to and the execution of Just Cause. Like, how did that all, t- tell me your, your, your take on it, your, your kind of the way it, uh, it happened for you. Well, for me, it, uh, Just Cause was, I, that was uh, all the training that we had been doing when you go out on the training portions of it and uh, during that cycle that you're training, uh, we had various objectives or various missions that were going to be assigned to the battalions. And uh, unbeknownst to me, at uh there were some that I was not aware of, obviously. Uh, and uh, we had trained to do this exact same thing time and time and time again by jumping into one of the primary missions of the uh, Ranger Battalion. That that point in time was airfield seizure. Right. And uh, we had trained. Our target was Torres to Cumin Airfield in uh the, the major airport in Panama. And we had trained and trained and trained for that. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, you know, I, I forget. Oh, we were, Marty and I, or I, I think uh, Marty was out, oh, I think we both, both might have been out hog hunting in, uh, in, in the Savannah area up at Fort Stewart in that area and came back in and they said, okay, you know, let's get ready. We're going, and you, you always hear that you're going, and then you, you go and you get ready, and you pack everything up, and you get staged to go. But that day it was different. They issued us ammo. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, they got to account for every round. If they're issuing us ammo, you know, we're probably going to do something this time around. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a 24 hour period from the time I think we got notification to the time that, uh, we actually loaded up and I'm the final briefing to, uh, to the air force. Cause we were then the talk and all the, uh, aviators were getting a final final briefing. And I remember the, uh, air force guy who was briefing the C one hundred and thirty and C one hundred and forty one crews. He said this, you will not deviate on heading and altitude until every one of those Rangers that is out of the back of your airplane. And because evidently in uh, Granada, when they had had the last airborne assault, there was some deviation and people got strewn or people got dumped where they shouldn't oh. be or injured. And uh, I thought, okay, 
this is going to be pretty difficult for them also. <laughs> so, I thought, okay, that that's when I got the real appreciation for the trash haulers or the yeah. guys that push that fly the aircraft that we jump into, jump out of. If if they're uh, if they're having to hold headed in altitude while they're getting shot at, it's probably you know they got to have some balls too. Sure. And I had a I, I never forgot that I had had a brand new appreciation for those drivers that yeah. uh, put parachutists out the back. So that that gave me a appreciation for them also. And yeah. we ended up going out the back and. Uh, some of the things I remember the most about that, I had been to combat before in the battalion, the Colonel Wagner was the, and uh, there was one other person, I think the first sergeant were the only, and myself were the only three people who had actual combat experience. Wow. So uh, from Vietnam. And uh, I remember that, <laughs> that uh, a lot of the guys, you know, were didn't know what was going on. So I said, okay, Gary, you got to, uh, you got to, they are going to look at you and the other folks who have been there before to see how you react. So I said, okay, you've been here before, you know what it's like, just do what you're supposed to do and let them see what you're supposed to, what they're supposed to do also. Yeah. So that I, I took that upon myself and hopefully it, it was worth what I was doing because it, it didn't hurt anything. It just set the set the example, which is what you're supposed to do. Right. And <laughs> we were one of the first ones out of the back. And uh, I, we jumped in, I think, what the normal altitude is like 1,200 feet. But yeah. I think we jumped in at a lot lower. It was either 900 or 600. I know that they there was a lot of discussion do you do we even need to wear backup shoots right right and uh i don't i forget if we did or didn't but i remember they opened it up and it's like okay fine and i i'll not forget this in the back somewhere up in front of the plane somebody else Let, let's get some and i'm thinking well that's good but you know what? You really don't know what you're saying until you get there. Right. So <laughs> let it let that let's get some happen when you figure out exactly how it how you respond to it. Right, right. So, but it we, we jumped out, got down there, got on the deck, and the first thing I remember is I landed on a runway, which I was supposed to, and I was one of the uh, first. The talk was the first people out of that airplane, and in, in the plane I was in, and. Uh, Got down, got my slammed a, uh, a magazine in the uh, the weapon, and all I see is this set of headlights coming straight at me. And I'm thinking, well, that damn sure can't be ours because we don't have any people down here in, in vehicles with headlights. So it's coming up the runway, coming up the runway, and I'm thinking, was well, it going to turn off or not? So it wasn't turning. So I got in a prone position. Took the safety off, and I had a trigger point as to exactly when I was going to open fire and where I was going to try and put the rounds. Mm -hmm. And it turned off just prior to that, went down around someplace else, and I found out later that that particular uh, uh, vehicle was hit with a 105 round that was brought in by, I forget the guy's name. He was a sergeant in the, in the fire support section that brought a 105 round out of the ac-130 down on them oh yeah so that it got its own anyway yeah, uh, yeah. so and i i guess one of the things that you think about I, all this stuff you process you know if i open fire <laughs> what are how are the rest of the people around me going to react <laughs> right is, right is it going to be me <laughs> they're going to shoot that or they're going to shoot at the damn jeep or the truck whatever it was <laughs> So, right, right. It's funny how you process stuff. So that was good. We got done and all met up. And I remember the next morning, I had the worst headache I've, uh, I've ever had in my life from not sleeping for 24 hours and not drinking enough water. Right. That got a hell of a migraine. But Doc gave me two. Gave, I think Doc actually gave me a shot and it fixed it up. So Doc Donovan, yeah. uh, he's a, he's, He's history. I, by history, I mean he is somebody everybody knows at that point in time. Yeah. 
Yeah, Marty said it was just ungodly hot down there. So it was just brutal. When you left, it was kind of chilly. And then when you got down there, it was just muggy and yeah, just ungodly hot down there. That didn't stick in my mind. But I'll t- some of the other stuff, I because I was with the uh, the guy in charge of the TACP. You know, when we had meetings, I could, <laughs> I was around. But otherwise, having, again, the experience that I had, uh, I, I did a lot of exploring. I yeah. went to a lot of the warehouses looking for exactly what we got, what we got in here. Remember finding all kinds of freaking, uh, uh, what are those things, those cakes called fruit cakes, all oh, kinds really? of big, <laughs> big ass fruit cakes in the, in the, uh, <laughs> in the warehouses. And I was looking for like Gucci watches and stuff, sure, to see sure. what but all I found was food and toys and stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, I spent a lot of time searching for stuff. Yeah. I, I did find uh, in one of the offices, I ended up going in there, and that was uh, one of the commanders of the uh, <clears throat> infantry battalion that was stationed at Trios Tacumen. I ended up with his uh, little thing where he has cards in, uh, some mementos that I brought back on that. But okay. That was about it. And then, of course, Marty told you about the champagne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, follow me. I got, I got, a, I got, a, I got a New Year's surprise for you. <laughs> got it. That's hilarious. It popped it. I got it all over myself. And they said they're gonna, they're gonna smell. I said, okay, what are they gonna do to me? Not much. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That was a, and the other thing I remember again about Panama was that uh, we had captured the battalion uh, and the, the destruction that the uh, AC 130 had done to the barracks. Yeah. I mean, that would, the whole roof was like gone from the 40 millimeter, and uh, that was fired down there. And, Anybody who would have been in that barracks would have not survived yeah. or not come out, not wounded, because it sure, was sure. just torn apart. And I thought, thank God that's on our side. <laughs> right. So, and then I got the, the other, again, I don't, I remember, well, of course, there wasn't much going on really in uh, Panama, but the, we uh, went out on patrol and uh, <clears throat> all we had was MREs. But somebody who spoke Spanish, we had the Spanish speakers in the battalion, they found this lady and she made us chicken and rice. And we all donated money to her. So we, that was the best meal I had down there was homemade chicken and rice. We all got it. It was, it was I don't know how we got, how we got to eat it, but we got it and it was great. So yeah. that was my uh, just cause was that... Uh, the training to get there and the uh, experience of jumping out of an airplane at that altitude at that night under those conditions, uh, that was an experience again. Yeah, I feel fortunate sure. to have. Oh, for sure. Yeah. How long were you guys down there? I think we were down there. Be- I think we jumped in on like the 20th or something like that. Yeah. I think I got back at mid-January or something okay. to that effect. I don't remember the exact dates, but I know it was over Christmas and New Year's. And actually, I don't even remember the flight back. I remember the flight back from uh, from Desert Storm, but I don't remember that flight back. Uh, so I don't know. Well, speaking of that, uh, let's let's move into that one. That's that was all. I always thought that was pretty cool because, you know, there it was a big uh, mechanized war, and uh, not a lot of Rangers got to go. So, um, yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about how, um, was there any kind of train up for that as well? Like for just cause or was it, how was no, how that? No, that was, uh, that was very, uh, interesting. Cause initially I thought well, the Rangers would be one of the first people to go over there. But, uh, I guess that, uh, the commander, uh, general Schwarzkopf did not request the Rangers for, for whatever the reason. Initially, so we didn't get over there for I think like two or three weeks before the actual uh, launch uh, was was going. There was no train up; they just called in the battalion. Actually, they called in uh, B Company, Bravo Company, yeah. and that was Marty's company. So Marty went on that one, 
and they were said, okay, you guys are going here, going there. And they just brought us in very quietly. Uh, I don't think any, you know, like a whole bunch of people didn't know the, I don't think maybe some of the other companies did even know they put us in a big warehouse. They said, okay, change clothes. And we changed into the old greens, into the, uh, the chocolate chip type uniforms oh, okay. at that point in time. And, uh, then they said, here's where you're going. And, uh, loaded up on our aircraft and ended up flying over there, tank it on the way. I don't think we stopped anywhere. I think we tanked, landed at uh, uh, RR, mm -hmm. and that's where we were stationed and moved into there. And the base itself, uh, where we were, was a, uh, a classified area at that time. So there weren't a whole lot of people there, and there weren't a whole lot of preparation. Uh, the SAS guys were stationed there. Okay. And uh, uh, the Rangers, and I forget, uh, that might have been the only two people that were stationed there. And it was a small base, and uh, by no preparation, I mean, the reality of the matter is we didn't have a lot of supplies uh, when we first got there. So we ended up eating a lot of baklava that was brought in <laughs> and hard-boiled eggs. Baklava oh and hard-boiled eggs was all you got. In oh fact, it was just hard-boiled eggs for the longest time. And then finally we got some baklava. And we ended up, uh, you know, putting up tents and s stuff like that. We didn't have the AC at that time, so the tents were just set up. But it got chilly at night there. And uh, there was a lot of training that went on and a lot of, for upcoming missions. And uh, that's, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's where the, uh, it's putting two and two together, that's where the uh, SAS team that was lost, yeah. uh, not by lost, I don't mean killed, but actually, you know, was gone for a while, right, right. accounted for. I think that's where they were out of. Oh, okay. There, because uh, the SA, SAS guys is interesting. No alcohol, no alcohol, but they would invite you over for tea, and they had footlockers full of alcohol, and you always <laughs> went for tea because tea meant <laughs> you're going to get a little bit of whiskey. So that was one upside there. And uh, they trained, and one of the first missions, Marty was on the first mission, and uh, one of the first missions was to go and take out a communications tower, which they had. They had brought in the SF uh, demo guys. Mm -hmm. So, and then as I Marty's got a great picture of that uh, that he puts on his wall, a great big picture that I really thought was wonderful. But as I recall, they planted charges around the tower uh, and <laughs> they blew it. And it didn't fall down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they brought in the experts, but the extra experts miscalculated something. Eventually it went down, but oh, yeah, the, yeah. the initial blow, as I recall, the tower didn't totally <laughs> fall down. Yeah, that that's sucks. okay. Living yeah. And oh, then uh, we, were we, were, we were training for another <laughs> mission to go out, and that was going to be during the, uh, the major assault. Mm-hmm. But uh, that mission got canceled, and uh, that was about the extent of the time there. Yeah. It was a lot of yeah. preparation, one mission, and then back to the house. And that probably had a lot to do with the armor guys just doing their job in a, you know, in a uh, efficient oh. way. You know, there wasn't much resistance, I don't think, during that time, no. for sure. No, it was, it was over in a day. As I yeah. recall, it was 48 hours, and it was over two days, and the whole thing was done. Which yeah. surprised me because they had all these. <clears throat> and the one thing that I remember was, and going to go back to the morbid part, they had brought over, I don't know many, how many tens of thousands of body bags in the anticipation of that was the anticipated uh, amount of people we were going to lose. Wow. And uh, I think the total losses obviously were under a thousand folks as i recall yeah. so the whole thing the way it went uh intelligence wise 
was not even close to what they had anticipated how it was going to go. So good it's thing. That's a good thing. It's good that it went that way. That it Absolutely. wasn't. Uh, yeah, for sure. So you but guys redeployed right. from that, and then, um, yeah, how much longer did you stay at First Battalion before you said you retired out of there? Yeah, I ended up. Uh, I forget exactly when I got back, but I had I had gone to Mountain Home. And uh, they had gotten a brand new ALO in, and uh, he wasn't fully trained up. So I knew the uh, operations officer, Mark Pentecost, later became the battalion commander. But oh, Mark okay. and I still go turkey hunting together and do, oh, elk hunting. But uh, I, I made him promise me before I left, because I had the option of leaving or not leaving. I said, if you guys deploy, you got to bring me back. And I got the mountain home. I hadn't been there maybe a week or two. And they came down and said, okay, luck, you're going back to first bat. They requested you by name. And why I said, but I had made Mark promise me he'd bring me back. Yeah, he, he did. So, yeah, so I got, uh, I was fortunate. I, I consider myself fortunate to be able to have that experience also. Uh, life's all about experiences and I've had plenty of them, which makes yeah. me a full life. <laughs> for sure uh so then um when did what year did you retire i retired uh, january 1st 1992 okay so not much longer after you guys you guys got back from desert storm no. okay no. uh almost very quickly uh i got uh went back to mountain home and i think i mean i couldn't have been there very long at all and then uh my retirement came and away i went I mean, you, it, it's well deserved. I mean, three combat deployments. I mean, there are three three different combat, you know, uh, conflict deployment conflicts. Right? Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think you deserved a, a good retirement after that. Well, yeah, you did your time. If I'd have, if I'd have had my choice, I'd have gone back to the battalion and I'd have stayed there until I retired. That's how. That's what I'd have done. I uh, that was home. But I can't say I don't enjoy Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I haven't uh, I haven't slowed down much. I uh, I started racing cars when I was 66 years old, nice. and uh, last year was my best year. I won three features in Meridian and uh, a couple other races in various other places. So right on. We keep we keep plugging. I need the adrenaline. Sure. So what have you been? What did you do when you retired till then? Like, what have you? What what's uh, what is your post military life looked like since then? Okay. Well, uh, when I got out, uh, I wasn't sure exactly uh, what I was going to do. I ended up uh, working for Lockheed Martin, and uh, what I did there was I was a uh, a targeting specialist with what was called the AFMIS. And uh, what it did is it planned routes and stuff and targets for the uh, aircraft that were uh, in the no-fly zone in I I Iraq at the time. Okay. And uh, so I I was went to I was at Mount Home and then I went to Saudi Arabia uh, with those guys over there and worked over there in Saudi Arabia until uh, until the uh, attack on the towers. And uh, or the attack on uh, uh, the tw yeah in the states nine eleven, uh -huh. so I stayed over there a little bit longer. Came back and at that point in time, <clears throat> excuse me, I got uh, hooked up with a company that teaches leadership to uh, high risk occupations. Okay. We firefighters, police, uh, some military but first responders in those areas. And I've been doing that off and on since about 2001 or 2002. I retired again, I'm 18, but because of COVID they had, they were short folks. So they called me back. So okay. on a very limited basis in the winter time, I do that because I don't have anything else to do other than go out and shop and work on cars. <laughs> so, uh, and the, probably this year or next year will be my last year doing that and then i'll probably just fish you're right <laughs> okay so that's what i'm doing now that's pretty awesome that you were able to pass on your all that knowledge i mean you, gee whiz you had you know all those 
all those years of knowledge in the military and combat and, you know, being in high stressful situations, I'm sure you got a lot to, to offer to those, you know, first responders as far as like leadership and how to, how to operate under quote unquote fire. Yeah. The, uh, the biggest thing I think that I can bring across to them is what stress does to the body and the mind and how stress affects your decision-making process. And unless you have an awareness of how that actually works for you or against you, or, and if it's working against you, how can you make it work for you? Uh, you'll go out there and you'll encounter that situation and you won't have that ability to adjust on the fly. Yeah. So I somehow I figured it out and my body reacted positively to stress. By that, I mean, I knew when it was going and what I could do to try and take it away. And, of course, the military does the same thing by giving you stress inoculation, crawling under the wire when they're showing, uh, shooting the, the weapon over your head. That's right. nothing more than getting used to stress in, in unknown situations. So, yeah, trying to pass that stuff on and prepare them for what's going to happen when you get to that situation that is a life or death situation. How are you going to react? what can you do to make yourself react in a more positive manner? I enjoy it. That's a good point. Well, do you have any, uh, I, I always ask guys if they have any personal endeavors or personal initiatives or any kind of thing that you're, that you are passionate about. The biggest thing I'm doing right now is my wife works with uh, children, physically and sexually abused children. And I will assist her in any way in uh, trying to, get help for the kids and uh, I'll donate financially for to sure. anybody that needs it that I think deserves it. Yeah. So I, I will go out, there, out, of, out of my way. I don't need a lot of money. I just need to be comfortable, which I am. Right on. Um, does she work for like a, uh, like a, a government agency or is, she, is it a private organization that we can pitch or. She works for St. Luke's hospital. And, okay. uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting. Some of the things that uh, have changed totally, and I don't know if this is on subject or not, but uh, she has noticed that uh, she had a, uh, which I found totally unusual, is a, uh, a single digit in, uh, individual, eight or nine years old, who was suicidal at that age. And wow. it's like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. And then, you know, she's dealing with children today. I don't know, you know, the the reason, if I could find the reason. Children today have, are more uh, teenagers. Teenage suicide is through the roof. Yeah. And I think back on my life and it's like, man, this is times that you should be enjoying things, going out and playing and enjoying folks and, you know, just the part of your life. And I don't know what's changed. I just, uh, I'm just sorry. I feel very yeah. sorry for the kids today. It almost seems like they have an, 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 an uh, like an exorbitant amount of stress, more stress than we ever did as kids. Like it's amazing how the, the, the weight of the world is placed on these children's shoulders sometimes. So for no reason, really. Absolutely. And, uh, my two grandsons, one who just got out of the Marine Corps. So that tells you how old they are. Uh, <laughs> They uh, they asked me like a couple Christmases ago. They say, Grandpa, would you have rather grown up when you were, when you did, or now? And I looked at them and I said, When I grew up, my time, there's no no way that I would like would like to have traded places in time with what I had to compare what the the stress the kids have now. It's sure. freaking unreal. And it's, it's beating them. It's beating them up. If I'm not king for a day, so I can't change things. But if I could take one thing away, there'd be no more cell phones in the world. <laughs> it, it does seem like a contributor to the, to the problem, doesn't it? Let them, let them talk to each other face to face. Or ride their bikes to their friend's house, you know, like we used oh, yeah. to. Or, yeah. if, I guess if we could get together and uh, change everything, we could come up with a good solution. We could, we could do it. <laughs> And personally, I'd like to see the draft come back too. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. But I, we that's... we talk about that quite a bit. Like the just I I don't know where I would have been had I not got in the military. You know, what I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way, but like it, it really shaped me. It really gave me a purpose. It, you know, and I think there's I think like to your point, there's a lot of kids out there that are lacking that kind of sense of purpose. And even even if you just get in the military just to get to college or just to get a learn a skill or just to get three hots and a cot, you know, who whatever the reason it's a good deal. I mean, I, I've always pitched the military as a, as a really good deal. And I, it's amazing how they continually miss their quotas on enlistments and stuff like that. You know, I don't know. What do you, what's yeah. your take on that? Well, my take is what it did for me is it made me responsible for my actions. It made, it forced me to be able to, to shine my boots. It forced me and if you want to put that in a much larger category, it it forced me to be accountable. And because up until that time, you know, I had, I had qualities that were there, but I would, you know, I just, I wasn't forced into that. You know, there were no repercussions for walking out and uh, being looking like a slob or whatever. Right. It, it made me, it made me a more disciplined human being and realizing that I can achieve more than I was. It forced sure. me to do that. And that, I don't think without that happening, I'd have, I'd have stayed in my hometown. I'd have worked at John Deere and I'd have just, I'd, I'd had no drive, so to speak. I'd have been content right. where I was. Right. And I, I don't want to imply that, the only way is the military, but like to your point, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people out there that are just kind of muddling through and they don't really have any purpose. And they, they, like you said, nobody's holding them accountable and they, they get, they just keep going down that road. Whereas if they would have had that foundation, maybe that we had, it could have, you know, even for four, four years or two, two or four years, whatever it used to be, you know, they could have maybe uh, catapulted them to the next level. Yeah, it, I think as I think about it, as we pro I go through this, it's like the drill sergeants said, you will do this, you will do that. And then I had to do it. There was no, there was no backing out of it. There was no uh, compromising on it. It is something that I had to do. And it made me responsible for the stuff like, and realizing that when somebody tells you, you know, you need to do something, you have to do it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's no like, well, I'll just quit. There was no choice. Like you, so it kind of instills that that sense of discipline into you. Yeah, for sure. Well, you're walking a patrol in Vietnam. You're tired. You're thirsty. You're everything, and all you want to do is sit down. <laughs> all you want to do is sit down and not move. But realizing right, right. that if you sit down, they're going to keep on walking. So exactly. you better keep on walking. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Kids today think they can sit down anytime they want to. Yeah. I, I, throwing it into that context. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's a good point. It, and again, not, it's not for everybody, but it's a good, it's a good foundation for sure. For, yeah. for a lot of guys. For sure. Anybody who's floundering, who has no idea what's going on. And quite honestly, when I, <laughs> this is off subject, but when I joined the military, uh, drafted, I should say, when I was drafted in the military, my pay was $90 a month. And out of that $90, uh, we had to buy a $10 savings bond every month. But then I looked at a guy that I was in the Marine Corps with who said, you know, if you think about it, they gave you a place to stay because everybody had to stay in the barracks. They gave you a place to stay. You got you got an, had enough money to buy toothpaste, toothbrush, shavers, and they fed you every day. Right, you didn't right. You need any more damn money. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Like, what do you need money for? <laughs> you have exactly. everything you possibly need, yeah. And you couldn't go off base. In order to go off base, you had to have a pass. Right. Yeah. And that was the old days, but yeah. 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 Well, what's yep. it going to do? Well, sir, I, I don't want to take up much more of your time. I, yeah. I, this has been phenomenal. I, this listening to your, your uh, career was fascinating and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for sitting down with me and, uh, and doing all this. I really appreciate it. Well, I, thank you for letting me share. Oh, uh, for sure. An old guy needs to talk. You just let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. It was very awesome. Well, I'll be looking forward to listening to it. It well, I talking. appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. And all those other rangers you talk to, you tell them who. Are. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> okay. So. Well, thanks again. All right, sir. 
Have a good day. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now.